Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Good to see folks joining on this morning. If you have any questions or comments during the uh, stream today, please use the comment section. As always, I always welcome any comments or questions on what's being taught. We're working our way through the gospel account of Matthew, Matthew's account of the life of Christ, and we are... Uh, we are about to wrap it up here for Matthew's account. We are in the last last few minutes, in fact, of Christ's life uh, before his death on the cross. Of course, we understand he's resurrected, but he's getting ready to die. We read and studied through Matthew 27, verses 1 through 44 yesterday. And so we're going to finish the chapter today, verses 45 through 66. So I hope you got your Bibles with you and are ready to study. My plan is uh, we'll finish Matthew probably tomorrow. We'll look at Matthew 28 tomorrow, the resurrection, some events that took place after the resurrection. Matthew has a fairly short account of these events. Um, so, <clears throat> so we'll look at that tomorrow and the, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew. And then that'll be it for this week. Um, I told you a while back, one of the one thing I've been asked to, to teach through on uh, the next set of videos is the book of Daniel. So I think I will do that. I think Daniel will be our next study. Anyway, we are in Matthew chapter 27 today. Hey, Brian, good to see you. Derek, good to see you. Matthew 27, verse 45, it says that it was the sixth hour until the ninth hour that there was darkness over all the land. Now, this is uh, noon to three. All right, 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock p.m. Christ has already been nailed to the cross. He is in the process of dying. Again, this is why he came to this earth. Hey, Miss Louise and Connie and Linda, glad to see all of you joining on the stream. About the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Heard a lot of interesting comment, commentary, um, lessons presented on this phrase here, this statement that Jesus makes. One thing I would tell you to do is, if you want to do further reading on this, read the 22nd Psalm. In fact, we are going to do a little bit of that. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to mark here in Matthew 27. And we're going to turn to the 22nd Psalm and look at some things here. Hey, Owsley's. Hey, uh, Lyle. Uh, the 22nd Psalm is one of those messianic psalms. Uh, a lot of things in that psalm stated, written down, that were fulfilled in Christ, particularly in regard to what we are reading about today in Matthew 27. So there, there are different views of, of, as to what is happening here when Jesus says, Why have you forsaken me? So some people take the position that, well, it, it got dark outside, Jesus then makes this statement because he became sin and God can't look at sin and so God turned his back on Jesus. I've heard that explained. Um, in fact, I was listening to a sermon a few weeks ago online. Usually when I get to my office first thing in the morning, I'll either read an article or read something out of a book or I'll listen to a sermon or a live stream or a podcast or something just for my own benefit, uh, kind of get my wheels off the ground, you might say, first thing in the morning. Um, so anyway, a few weeks ago I heard a preacher dealing with this statement here in Matthew 27 and verse 46, where Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he had a very emotional presentation. Um, sincere, there's no question about it. Um, I've known this man for a long time, a sound gospel preacher, but I think he missed it here because he said that God and Christ were separated at the cross. God couldn't look at his son. I don't, I don't think I can agree with that. So he quotes the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you never read that Psalm, you may think, indeed, well, God did forsake Jesus. But if you actually read the 22nd Psalm, you know that is not what happened with David, the psalmist, when he wrote that. 
So Psalm 22 verse 1 opens, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. I continually cry out, why won't you do something? Why won't you say something? And incidentally, there are a lot of psalms like that. In fact, there are some writings in the prophets that are like that. Uh, is it Habakkuk? I think it's Habakkuk that opens up with the, the prophet questioning God. When are you going to do something about all the evil that I'm surrounded by? Well, as you keep reading through this psalm, number one, it is, again, a messianic psalm, the, the first verse there. Uh, then you go down to Psalm 22 and verse uh, 7. Those who, seek me, those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Well, that's what we, we read through that yesterday uh, in the first part of psalm, uh, Matthew 27. Um, then you go down to verse uh, Psalm 22, verse 4. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. Uh, dogs have surrounded me, verse 16. They've pierced my hands and my feet, verse 16. I can count all my bones. They divide my garments among them, and, my clo and for my clothing they cast lots, Psalm 22, verse 18. So you see then what I mean by saying that this is a messianic psalm that starts out with the exclamation, the exclamatory question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here's my condition. Well, I have to turn the page here. Psalm 22. And, and the, the psalmist wonders, what well, I've cried out to you day and night. Why don't you listen to me? Listen to Psalm 22 and verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. See, the psalmist wasn't forsaken by God, and Jesus was not forsaken by God. I think that's the point here. When Jesus is hanging there on the cross, and he's dying, and people are mocking him, they've been beating on him and spitting on him, doing all of these things to him. Hey, Mom. Hey, Don. It appears to the world that he is God-forsaken. But he is not. The psalmist was not God-forsaken. He may have felt that way with what he was going through, with the difficulties he was suffering, and certainly Jesus with what he was going through. Remember, I told you, uh, when we were going through Psalm 26 and looking at the prayer in the garden, um, Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36, you see the humanity of Christ here more than at any other point in his ministry, I believe. If it's possible, Father, please let this cup pass from me. He knows what he's about to endure, and he makes that prayer. Now he's hanging on the cross, and he has this exclamation, Why have you forsaken me? Think about this. If God had forsaken Christ, okay, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is a part of the Godhead. He was the perfectly sinless human being who died in the stead of sinful human beings. Okay? He took upon himself what we deserved. He didn't become a sinner. He paid the price for sin. If, if God had forsaken him, like some people believe that he did here, uh, Matthew 27, verse 46, then you have a division in the Godhead itself. You have God the Father forsaking God the Son. And I just, I, it doesn't work. Go back to John chapter 17, which is not, that's the same night in which he was betrayed there. Incidentally, John 17, he says, I and my father are one. God didn't forsake him. Um, no, I don't think he was mistaken. Good morning, Mark. I don't think he was mistaken. Um, I think what we're doing here is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. He's quoting this psalm. In appearance, he was forsaken by God. But I don't think he was. I don't think there's any indication in the text that he was. And again, the psalmist made that same exclamation and said, I've cried out to you day and night. You don't answer me. But then you get down to Psalm 22 and verse 21. He says, you have answered me. Um, and you read the, from Psalm 22 verse 21 through the end of that psalm. You see that the psalmist wasn't forsaken by God. He may have felt that way. It may have appeared to his enemies that God had forsaken him. But God had not forsaken the psalmist any more than he had forsaken Christ. 
Uh, there's not going to be this division in the Godhead of um, God the Father turning His back on the second person of the Godhead. Uh, that would present a whole other <laughs> uh, group of problems, we might say. So back to Matthew 27. Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, they heard what Jesus said. Well, He's crying out for Elijah. There was a lot of misunderstanding, obviously, of who Jesus was and His purpose, and we know that. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. This sour wine, this, this is different from the wine that was offered to him back in verse 34, that uh, sour wine mingled with gall. That was more narcotic, a, a pain-relieving effect. He didn't drink that. Um, he did, according to other accounts here, Matthew, when you put Mark, Luke, and John with this, he did drink of this. Um, the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come save him. He cried out again. Of course, we know with the other accounts, specifically with John's, his, his final cry was, it is finished. And he yielded up, the text here says, New King James, he yielded up his spirit. The separation of the spirit and body is the point of death. Um, what is it? Genesis thirty-eight twenty-five. I think it is where uh, Rachel was giving birth to Benjamin, and it says her spirit departed from her, for she was dying. It's a parenthetical statement there. Now, I gave you the wrong scripture reference. Maybe it's Psalm, maybe it's uh, Genesis 35. Well, here we go. Genesis 35, 18. And it was so as her soul was departing, parentheses, for she died. Well, this is where Jesus dies. He gave up his spirit. Then behold, now notice what happens when he dies here. There's some interesting things that we need to be aware of. When he dies, number one, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now this is a massive piece of drapery. You go back to the book of Exodus and read the measurements of this thing. Um, one, one thing that I read about it is the, the thickness of, of this curtain was about the thickness of a hand. This is a massive garment here, and it's torn from the top to the bottom. It's 60 feet by 30 feet, the dimensions. When he died, it's torn from the top to the bottom. Now, what does that mean? Let me share this passage with you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Let me get over here real quick. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. We have direct access to God because of what he's done for us. That, that The veil, of course, in, uh, in the temple, it would have been witnessed by the people serving in the temple, representing a new and living way made available now. Uh, this, this old law was nailed to the cross. And this splitting of this veil, the tearing of this veil from top to bottom shows this. There was an earthquake. The rocks were split. Graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Matthew just kind of groups the whole thing together, his death and his resurrection. And the way Matthew records it here in verse 53, um, there was a resurrection that took place locally there. After his resurrection. Hey, Miss Loretta. Interesting things taking place here. Notice the response. When the centurion and those, who with, uh, those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. There's no, for, for some of them anyway, there's no doubt in their mind. Now, other gospel accounts that Matthew doesn't... Um, Matthew doesn't include this. Let me flip over here real quick. Uh, Mark, you get to Mark chapters 14 and 15, and you read about all these things. Um, Mark records the statement, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He breathed his last. Luke records all these. So each, each writer records essentially the same thing. You have some different sayings recorded. There are seven, as we say, seven last sayings from the cross. One writer records that they, they came by to check the bodies. Uh, they broke the legs of the two um, criminals that were crucified around Jesus. But when they got to Jesus, he was dead already so that they didn't break his legs. 
Uh, that's in John's account. I shared a video on our public page here a couple days ago, and it's done by WVBS. And I, somebody recommended it to me. I forget who it was, but I appreciate it. It talks about how they broke the legs. They used a heavy club to hit the people in the shins and break their legs at the shin. So they couldn't push up anymore to breathe, to expand their lungs. Uh, this was a brutal process. Just absolutely brutal. Well, Jesus is dead. They don't have to break his legs, which is another fulfillment of, of Old Testament prophecy. But the people standing around, even a Roman soldier, truly this was the Son of God, Matthew 27, verse 54. There were women there um, ministering to him. They were looking on from afar. Uh, there was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. These women were prominent throughout the life of Christ. An evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. Um, other accounts tell us not only was it Joseph, but also Nicodemus, the guy we read about in John chapter 3. They come and ask for the body of Jesus. Uh, verse 58, they ask Pilate. He gives them the body. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which was hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary, sitting opposite the tomb. It's done. This is why he came. You know, even, and, and John's account, again, is a unique account, but it records some of these things. This is the commandment that my Father gave me, he said in John 10, verses, oh, verses 17 through 18 or so, that I should lay down my life. He said, no man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. His death was voluntary. Remember back in the garden. Listen, I could call 12 legions of angels if I wanted to. That's not why he came. On the next day which followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive. Think, think about this now. These guys have made it their mission for the last three years to, to get what they have, to, to kill Jesus. All right? They've seen the miracles. They've heard the teachings. They've seen the large crowds that follow Jesus. Something is bothering them, okay? They're, they're talking to the Roman governor. While he was alive, how, he, how, that deceived, how, the, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Well, if he is a deceiver, why would they then say this? Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Well, the reason they say that is, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. These people are too, uh, these people are so um, bent on getting rid of everything that Christ has done. To, to destroy all of the evidence that he has provided. Think about, you know, my mind goes back to John chapters 11 and 12. Of course, John 11, his friend Lazarus dies. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and a bunch of people know it. You turn to John chapter 12, and these same people that we're talking about here, they want to kill Lazarus so more people won't believe in Jesus. I mean, that's how uh, evil, how depraved these guys are. Hey, David. Hey, Sheila. Good to see you guys today. Let's make this tomb sure so that his, his disciples won't come and steal the body. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. The process of stealing, sealing the stone was basically, as, as it is accounted, it would take this massive stone, roll it in front of the hole in what we might call a cave in this tomb. And then one guy, I was reading one, it said they would, sometimes they would put a rope around the, where the stone met the face of the tomb, and then they would pour wax over that rope to seal it to know if it had been tampered with. Um, some just say, well, it was, a, it was wax, and that wax was marked with the insignia, something like that. Whatever the case may be, they know how to do this. They know how to secure it, so if, if there was any tampering, um, it, it would be known. So he's dead. You know, you, you kind of have to put yourself in the disciples' feet here, uh, in the disciples' shoes here, 
Um, this is the Messiah. He's coming to set up a kingdom, and he's dead. They don't get it yet, but they will. All right, guys, that is Matthew chapter 27, and I just looked up, and we're running about 22 minutes or so. I don't see any, well, here's a, okay, I addressed Mark's um, asking if Jesus uh, was mistaken. David says too many people look at the suffering of Christ as a penal substitution instead of a voluntary sacrifice. He willed himself. Uh, there's no question about it. I'll tell you another I mentioned John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Another passage that comes to my mind is um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, uh, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross. To me, that speaks to the voluntary nature. Uh, now, you know what David says there, a, a penal substitution, you know, and I touched on this yesterday, when he, fr from, the, from the appearances of it, him being crucified with two criminals, you know, the common thought of that day was, well, he's just another criminal. He was, as, as Isaiah 53 says, he was numbered with the transgressors. But he voluntarily went. Um, well, here's another verse that comes to my mind. First Peter, let me turn over here to First Peter chapter, I think it's First Peter chapter 2. Yeah, First Peter 2, uh, verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile again. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. All of these verses talk about the, or, or touch on the aspect of the voluntary nature of this death. Um, but particularly John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. And, and again, what he said in the garden, listen, Peter, put your sword up. I can call 12,000 angels right now and this would be over. We get that. But the fact that he took our place, I think that's the right way to put it. He took our place. He took upon himself the punishment that was due us. Because the wages of sin is death. We know that, Romans 6, verse 23. But uh, he took it upon himself, and he gave up his spirit. Remember, it says that. He yielded up the spirit, Matthew 27, verse 50 so that we might have access to eternal life, access to the forgiveness of sins, access to His blood. This is His mission. And He says, it is finished. He came to do something. He's done it. Now we wait for three days. And that's Matthew chapter 28. All right, guys. Appreciate you being on here today. Don't see any other questions or comments. Uh... Had a good number on the live stream today. I appreciate that. If you do have any further questions or comments after the stream's over, you can send me a private message. You can still comment here in the comment section. Of course, our YouTube channel is available too. The plan is we'll come back tomorrow and we'll look at Matthew chapter 28. It's only 20 verses. And uh, we will finish Matthew's gospel account. Hope this has been a beneficial study to you. And hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11. Have a good day.